I think we're on. Okay, this is Bethany's eating her little like brunch. Uh, this is the Sunday sermon. I think we're behind, not behind, but I didn't get to comment last week on the normal like verses that I'll cover. I didn't get to review the Catholic Mass verses, which I always like to include. But sure enough, I managed to put the radio on just to listen to the Mass. But I was hesitant because I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to wind up having those verses in my head, even though I didn't review them or look at them, just hearing them. And then I feel responsible, oh, I better comment on them. And sure enough, even though I didn't want to, I just listened on the radio. And so it was from Genesis and also from the letter of Peter, as well as a few others. And so I'll, I'll do that real quick because Pastor Bill... Church Unlimited also had some from Genesis. So the few uh, that I did catch from the radio, listening to the live broadcast, was the story of Noah, and it talked about Genesis uh, 6, I believe. And the story of Noah is famous for Bible students, but it just talked about how Noah and eight people, the Bible says, were saved at the time of the flood the flood that came as a judgment upon man and wickedness and the early history of man recorded in the Bible and that God brought a judgment and the judgment was a flood and the story of Noah and Noah's Ark one of my uh, one of my street friends actually was bringing up Noah's Ark the other day oh and it's funny because as I sit here where my daughter lives, you can't really see. That just came to my mind. He's one of my homeless friends. But he just told me last week he found an old abandoned boat. The homeless people sometimes, they find abandoned houses to live in. It's illegal. But if the cops find them living in an abandoned house, they normally don't arrest them. They normally just tell them you got to move on. Because it's... It's not so much criminal activity in these cases, it's people that are in distress. And so my friend that was just telling me about Noah's Ark the other day, he found a boat abandoned, and he pulled the boat, he has a four-wheel drive, he pulled the boat from the water where it was abandoned, he's got it on the bank of the water, and he's fixing it up, him and his girlfriend live in it. And it's not too far from where I sit. That's what just came to my mind because he told me where it was. I said, oh, you know, I go there, brother, I, which I do. I said, sometimes we ride our little four-wheelers. So that was interesting that people look for shelter wherever they can find it. So in the story of Noah's Ark, and then you had the flood, and the Bible says, and the other verse from the Catholic Mass was Peter, the apostle, who writing his letter to the Christians in the first century used the story of Noah. And he says, just like Noah and the eight souls that were saved by water, the flood came, they were in the ark, and what did the water do? The water lifted them up, but they were in this ark and everything else was destroyed. And then Peter says, the like figure, I'll quote the King James, whereunto baptism doth also now save us, not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a pure heart or conscience towards God. I could do a lot on these because there's a lot of controversy among Christian churches, and a lot is right in these verses. But I just like the simplicity of it because Peter the Apostle Peter himself simply said, it's not so much the water that can't even wash away our filthy flesh, but it's the conscience towards God. And in the New Testament and even in the Gospels, baptism was a sign of open confession of sin. Okay, that's what it meant. Those that were coming to the baptism when John the Baptist was baptizing and the Pharisees and the religious leaders who Jesus and John at times referred to them as hypocrites, but they started coming to the baptism of John, 
and John the Baptist. And he said, who had warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You hypocrites, bring forth fruit meats for repentance. Because they were coming to accept the message and to get baptized, which was a sign of repentance. But John was saying, it's not just this water in the Jordan that I'm baptizing you, but there's got to be a change of heart. So those are the two scriptures I'll hit on because I listened to the Mass. Uh, Bill did mention some, Pastor Bill, Church Unlimited, from Genesis. And I will think I'll just hit and end on this theme of what I've been speaking about. I just concluded the Ephesians study. Bill has Ephesians chapter 5 right in his message. He has Genesis chapter 2. And it's the theme in Scripture on marriage. And how in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, God made ma uh, male and female. And in the covenant of marriage, it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall be one. Now Peter, or Paul in the New Testament, when they go back to that uh, passage in Genesis, they say this means that in marriage union, two become one. Now, Paul, when he was rebuking the Corinthian church, he was rebuking them. I covered this the last six months or a year. He said some of them were going uh, prostitution, and the city of Corinth was like an open thing. And in the city of Corinth, it was just considered like, you know, uh, not really, it was like a cultural thing. Oh, if you're going to hire a prostitute, you know, you can hire a prostitute. Now, Paul had to rebuke the Christian church there, the Corinthians, and he said, no, you can't be doing that anymore, because they just thought, oh, it's okay, we're Christians, and then he would say, don't you know that the two become one, and now Paul's referring, and he's saying, if you're sleeping with the prostitute, he says, you're uniting in a union that is not just a physical union, but you're uniting in a, a, a spiritual way, and then you're making the members of Christ because we are members of the body of Christ, joining them with a harlot or a prostitute, you can't be doing that. So what the New Testament apostles were teaching is there's more than just a physical, natural thing that takes place in the marriage union, but there's a spiritual bond that takes place. Now, when I was teaching Ephesians and just concluded it uh, the other day, the passage in Ephesians, Paul's talking about marriage, he says, and this is a great mystery. And then he says, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, I already taught that, and my daughter Bethany didn't hear that teaching. I won't redo it. But Paul was basically saying, the mystery of us, the church, we are called the bride of Christ. And Jesus Christ himself is the bridegroom. And so we have this mystical union as the church, the bride of Christ, with Christ, and this is a great mystery. That's what Paul was referring to. Paul wrote in, and so I'm going to kind of stick with this, that particular theme, because there's a lot of different verses we could do, but I'll stick with that. In our, a lot of, many years ago, there was a uh, famous a pastor, teacher, famous mega church, and they were promoting. And I, you know, today Bill said, like, if you have young kids in the uh, service, if you're under, you know, twelve, uh, go to the children's church and all, because the issue is going to be about sex and marriage and so forth. And uh, of course, I've been in uh, services, and you know, and all of that's fine and okay, because in Scripture it gives you the basic guidelines of marriage and sex and of course it's always uh, in the marriage covenant meaning you're married anything outside of marriage is always considered off out of limits and off limits and then some as Christian teaching progressed some began saying just like in the issue of money and prosperity and so forth some said that the Christian church began to have a very negative view about sex in general. And because it's a traditional negative view about sex, therefore we, as the Christian church, 
should now openly talk about sex and various things, and we shouldn't be ashamed of talking about it because sex is a God-ordained thing. Now, all of that is true, but I think there was a mistake made. And the one example I'll give you, just as an example, I remember this mega church uh, minister many years ago, not from Corpus Christi, but then they were doing, it was like a promotional thing, and everybody in the congregation, I forget, it was everyone, they were going to, for one month, every married person have sex every day, or maybe six times a day, which would be quite hard to do, but either way, that was the promotion, and it made it like to the, you know, various media things, and then they were discussing, yes, and everybody in that congregation, sadly, not saying because of this, but later, uh, that ministry collapsed, that pastor had a downfall, and it had to do, by the way, with a sexual scandal. It was a very one of the famous cases. I'm not attributing it because of that particular view. But in the Christian churches over the last, you know, 30, 40 years or so, mega churches and all, they tried to say, we're going to combat the old traditional view that sex is bad. Now, that's really not what the traditional view was. But they, some believe that the old time churches taught that. Therefore, we are going to be speaking the truth, and therefore we're going to focus a lot on it. In some cases, we're going to talk about it and so forth. Here's, I think, where the mistake was made. All appetites given to humans, meaning the appetite for food, even the appetite for drink, or the physical appetite for sex, all of those are considered good in God. It's not a sin to eat. Everybody would tell you that. But the scripture says it's a sin to be a glutton. So you can overdo a God-ordained appetite thinking, well, it's a God-ordained appetite. Therefore, to do it often to as much as you can, that could be a mistake. Because in the comparison of food, the scripture says God gives us food. It's a God-ordained thing. It's a requirement for life. But to take that appetite and to overdo it, which is called gluttony, is a sin. And so in the guideline of the whole discussion on sex and the uh, teaching of Christianity and all, there's also a guideline to curb particular type of appetites, even if they are God-given. Now, we also have the principle in Scripture that's called fasting. There are times where you abstain from food. Most people know my habit is I eat once a day. Um, I don't recommend that for all people, but it is a form of fasting, and I've just found it's better for me to, I function better that way. Of course, all people don't have to do that. But if you are a Christian who maybe has never curbed the appetite for actual food, even though it's a God-given thing, then you might be lacking in an area of discipline. And so I felt that particular view when some of the churches started to re-institute, let's talk about sex, it's God-given, and so all of that's true, but it also does not mean you should give yourselves, even if it's a God-given, God-ordained thing, it does not mean you should never abstain from that particular thing, because Paul the Apostle in the New Testament actually talks about that. And we also have uh, stories in the Old Testament where when the people were dedicating themselves to God in particular ways, they abstained from the marriage bed. Not meaning it was wrong, not meaning, but it meant there was a discipline in the Christian life that also you would abstain from particular desires, even if they're God-ordained. Okay, now, so I just wanted to give that as balance because I think sometimes we miss that balance or we don't see it from that perspective, all right? I'll, I wasn't going to use this example, but being we're talking about, I'll use it now. Uh, the last, when I listen to talk radio a lot, one of the things that's like a pet peeve for me is I'll be listening to the news and on the talk radio channel at certain times when I'm catching the news, all of the uh, commercials for the Viagra, uh, erectile dysfunction, uh, they all run at a certain time, like, okay, give it a break. I remember that we had a famous senator, a good man by the name of Bob Dole. I'm not sure if he passed away, but over the last 20 years, when the 
Viagra and all these things were marketed and became popular. Uh, it's a fine treatment for, they refer to it as erectile dysfunction. You're not able to have sex anymore, and therefore this is a treatment for that. I'm not against it. I've never used it, and if, if people needed that. But then there were cases, and Bob Doe was one that was doing, like, the commercial. And at the time, Mr. Doe, famous senator who ran for president and never got uh, elected, he was maybe in his 70s at the time, 75, 76, or whatever. He was doing commercials that because he was now on Viagra, Cialis, whatever it is, it, it, it cured his erectile dysfunction and he's happily enjoying sex again with his wife, Elizabeth Dolan. But I also thought, is it a dysfunction if when you age in life, maybe you're in your 70s, I, this is not meant to condemn happily married people in their 70s who are still having sex, that's fine, but is it a dysfunction when you're getting up into your 80s to say, wait a minute, I don't have those same natural desires that I had when I was in my 20s or 30s, therefore I need to reinstitute them again through Viagra or whatever. There's a process in your life. You're going to lose appetite for food, which is a natural process as you age. You're going to lose appetite for other things. So it's not necessarily, and there were some cases where and as these drugs became marketed and became popular, there was a famous case of a man, I believe he was in his 80s, and him and his wife were something like this. It went, they were in a nursing home. They were living well. Somehow he got the prescription for it, and it came, became famous at the time because he actually left the nursing home, divorced his wife, and went out and enjoyed his sex life again as a young kid. I guess he was picking up women in their 60s. So sometimes I just think, though things are God-ordained things, it all does not always mean we should try to keep those things until the day we die. There are things that you naturally trend down on, and that could be uh, something that we're missing. Now, I'll, there's others I can give on that. There was an early Christian movement. I do forget the name, but I read a lot of church history. And I remember reading about them years ago. They began teaching that the sexual relationship in the Christian church, that you were to lay that aside. Now, they were branded as a cult because they had, like, not the mainstream views. But what they said was, we believe it's right for us now, as God's kids, to abstain from the marriage union. Now, Paul the Apostle, who was single, he wrote in the letter, I think, to Timothy, <coughs> but he said, some will forbid to marry and will command to abstain from meats. And he says, that's incorrect, meaning you never forbid marriage. Okay? But Paul also, when he was writing the Corinthians, which I already commented on, Paul was single, and when he was dealing with the marriage issue, he actually said this. He said, I wish all of you were like me, single and not married. Now that's interesting, because this is Paul writing in the, to the Corinthians. He was dealing with these types of issues, and he actually said, I would prefer that you would all be single and not married. He said, but if you cannot contain it's better for you to marry than to burn. Isn't that an amazing thing? <laughs> That's in the New Testament. He says, if you could be single like me, Paul says, he says, because those who are married, they have to give their time to please their mate and to please their spouse, and they have to be sidetracked in those things, and they can't be fully devoted to the service of God. He says, but if you're single... You can fully devote yours. This is in the Bible now. You can fully devote yourself to God. He said, but if you cannot contain from having sex, and some of them were going out and sleeping with harlots, he said, it's better then to get married than to burn in lust. Now, that should give us a balance there. Like, wait a minute, Paul. You're saying it is better to... This is just gives balance because I just felt like we got unbalanced in the, some of the 
overdoing of it. A lot of single Christians and people that are called to be single, they feel guilty in the modern church understanding because a lot of them are told the mindset of sort of like you have to find a mate and in the right time you will find a mate and if you do the right time some of them don't feel like they're going to have a mate and that's a calling in scripture a lot of them feel guilty because they don't hear what I just expressed if you don't have a mate whether you're male or whether you're female you say I don't feel like I'm going to even get married one day that's a calling in scripture that's okay it's okay to have that calling. If the other calling is to get married on, that's also okay. But we need to be careful that as we teach on these things, we don't leave out all the counsel of God, which I just kind of gave some of it. I wanted to just uh, talk 20 minutes. I wanted to just end with the one chapter. It wasn't in any of the verses from the Mass or from the Church Unlimited, but it's Paul again talking about marriage, but this one comes from Romans 7. By the way, some of the scholars who study scripture, some who criticize it, some who really get into these things, they find it amazing that Paul wrote so much about marriage and all being he was single. So that's one of the criticisms that you'll get from the critics of the Bible. They'll say, now, wait a minute, Paul was given all this instruction on marriage and he was single. And so that kind of comes up. But one thing in Romans 7, and this fits with really Paul's teaching on law and grace, and we are no longer under the law. We cannot be saved by keep trying to keep the law, but we are saved by grace. But then he fits it with this union with Jesus, this marriage where Paul, whenever he refers to natural marriage, then he says, but the great mystery about it is it shows us something about Jesus and us. Here we kind of goes that route. He says the great thing is not the marriage, the physical one. That's nothing compared to the real reality of our union with Christ. Now in Romans 7, this is what he says. He says, for a woman, as long as she is married to her husband and her husband is alive, she is bound by the law to her husband and if she goes out and commits adultery or sleeps around she's breaking the law thou shalt not commit adultery because her husband is alive okay that makes common sense but then he said but if the husband is dead she is free from the law to her husband and then she can go out and marry whoever she will. She is no longer bound by that law to her husband. Now that's an interesting thing because he, he's talking about the command of God and the commandments of God. And he basically says, uh, if there was a woman, the New Testament talks about widows and all, but if there was a woman, whatever age, and she said, I fell in love with this other person, and therefore I go out and I get with that other person, Paul says, because her husband is still alive, she's violating the law. Even though they say, oh, I'm in love with him, I'm going to marry this other person. But as soon as the husband dies, not through killing him, but if he naturally died, then she goes out. All of the same feelings and emotions is considered okay. And what released that woman in this example from being under judgment and condemnation for being with someone she loved. The only thing that released her was the death of her husband. It released her from the law to, have to not be able to go out and be with someone else. Then Paul says, for we are dead to the law by the body of Christ. He says, now look at this. We were under the law. This is the theological argument now. We were under the law, under the commandments, and under the judgment. But Christ, as our bridegroom, died on the cross. And his death freed us from the law, just like the example he gave. And then he says, so we could be married to another. To who? Paul says, even to him 
that rose from the dead. So in that one little example, that was like the insight Paul had, that's in Romans 7. He says, Christ dying for us freed us from that condemnation of the law. He was just using that marriage thing as an example. He said, and then we are free from the law, we are now in grace, and we are married to another, even to him that rose from the dead. And that's Romans 7. And so I'll end it with that because whenever we read in the New Testament the mystery of marriage and all the wonderful things we read about, and there are many things Hebrews says, uh, the marriage bed is undefiled, meaning it's sanctified. You never forbid marriage, but at the same time the balance was, as Paul's advice, if you're single and that you're calling, you might that might be more beneficial. So you always give a balance. But the greatest mystery when Paul teaches about marriage, it's stuff like that. I always felt that that one example, the one from Romans 7, that's not real popular. You don't see a lot of people like regularly quote that one. But I think that would be one that should come on the radios and all, you know. we uh, Christ died, freed us from the law, that we would be married to another, even to him that died for us and rose again. Therefore, we are no longer under the law of condemnation, but we're in this union with Christ. And we're free not to go out and sin, but we're free to be united with Christ, the, the bridegroom. All right, that's 26 minutes. Bethany, any questions? No. I didn't have you read any verses from... Uh, and I'll just add a few. So that's the Sunday sermon. I might add the Catholic verses too, being I uh, commented on them. All right, let's end with that. Father, I thank you for allowing us to do the another, another Sunday message. <coughs> I pray a blessing on everybody uh, that gets to watch the video and read the post. And uh, that you would open up our eyes that we would uh, see the things like the Apostle Paul was talking about that the, the greater mysteries in all these things is uh, Christ and, and the other things that we don't fully understand about being a Christian and being part of the church. And So I pray our eyes would be open. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.